Good morning, good morning, good morning. I want to give you guys a warning this morning. Next week, Father's Day, we have a powerhouse speaker coming in. Okay? Randy's going to be here next week giving you the Father's Day message. Listen, if you think that his charge is powerful, wait till you hear his message. You know, the Lord's put something on his heart that's just great and mighty. And uh, so I'm excited. Man, I wish all of you guys, like, moved to the middle so I don't have to run around the both sides of the church. But we'll do whatever. You can move if you want and fill the center of the church up. Or we can, you don't have to, you just can't. Good? All right. You guys all good this morning? You guys are kind of quiet this morning. Everybody's kind of quiet this morning. You guys just all soaking in the Lord this morning. It's like... when, I, when I listen to the worship music on the screen like we do, and you know, we're just, it's just a temporary thing for us, but when I listen to it that way, I do it the same way I get in the Word of God. I just feel like I'm there. I make it like I'm there. You know, I don't look at the distractions of it, but I make it like I'm there. And we just have to do that until we get where we're going. We've got a worship team right here on the front row. There's, this is part of our team right here that we're developing, we're growing, and we're, we're ministering with. So, and it's going to happen soon, soon, soon. Next week we have a worship team coming in. It's going to be amazing. I don't know anything about them. Theo recommended them to me, so I'm trusting his... I I don't know anything about them. I'm trusting his judgment on them, so um, I'm going out on them. That's something un, out of my range going out on that kind of a limb, but I trust him, so in that, I'm going to trust it. This is going to be good. They're all hair down to here, just like I used to be, and they're just headbangers, man, but um, we'll see what happens. Headbangers can worship, too. How many of you like headbanging music? We got a bunch of headbangers in here. Look. <laughs> no Metallica today. I want to talk to you guys. <laughs> I want to talk to you guys today about some warning signs. You know, everywhere, like this sign here. We've all seen this. How many of you have ever run one of these signs? Yeah. You know, we can also get, we can get numb to these signs that, that are out in front of us, these warning signs that keep us out of harm's way. We can get numb to these signs to the point that where we just scoot around them and scoot around them and scoot around them until finally tragedy happens. Hundreds of people, thousands of people a year get killed from railroad crossings thinking they can make it. And you might make it 99 times, but that 100th time that you ignore the sign it might take your life. And I want you to know this morning, I don't want you to get numb to the signs that God has for you. There's so many signs in His Word that He gives you that He has for you that you have to listen to, hear, and understand what He's saying. This morning, I'm going to give you a way to stomp on the enemy's neck. Hold him down. That's what we have to do. Put him in his place and let him know who we are and whose we are. We're going to remind him this morning that we are overcomers. No matter how long we've been in the faith, if you just come to Jesus yesterday, you believe in him, you're an overcomer. The same as if 50 years you've been serving God, you're an overcomer. The enemy needs to be reminded of that every now and then. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John, 1 John 5, 5. It says, who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe this morning? So I want you to say out loud, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I am an overcomer. You are. When you say those words, when you, when you realistically out loud say those words, the enemy cannot stand that. And you're crushing him by those very words. Reminding him who you are. Reminding him what God did for you. 
1 John 2, 12 through 14 says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his namesake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. And I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. You have overcome the evil one. Reminds me of Luke back there. He, he stepped up, up against me back there in the sound area, and, and I think he's getting taller. Is he getting taller at all? But Luke, the dude's big. I mean, he makes me look like a little wimp next to him, so I don't like standing to him very much. Standing to my short and like my height or something, I feel a little better, man. He just makes me feel like a little bitty guy. But he's powerful. So, these young men, you are strong. Because the word of God abides in you. How do we overcome the evil one? I mean, how do you overcome him on the daily walk, the daily life that you live for him? How do you overcome him? I overcome him by recognizing and knowing the voice of God. I know who God is. I know what his voice sounds like. I know when he speaks to me, what it, what it feels like, what it looks like, what I hear. And do you guys know that God will always give you a way out before the fall? He will always give you a sign and a way out before the fall. I mean, think of it. Think of every time that you've stepped into sin. I mean, like right now, just think of something you did wrong yesterday, the day before, whatever. Whatever. Still under the blood. God still loves you. But think of something. And then also let God show you where he gave you a way out in you, even though you still made that decision that you made. Like he clearly, like it's so clear to me the ways out that he gives me. <laughs> I mean, when you're hooked on something. You know, I remember there's a young man that um, hooked on drugs. Met many of them. And I told him one day, I said, <coughs> if you write the names of your sons and daughters, he had tattoos all over him. I said, well, unless you write the name of your son and daughter on your hand. And that way, when you go to take the drug that you're taking, you'll see that. It'll be a constant reminder of why you don't want to do that, why you want to stay out of that kind of a lifestyle. And for a moment, he listened to me. Now he's going to prison. Because he's numb to those warning signs. <laughs> numb to hearing the voice of God. Somebody give me a water, please. Thank you. <coughs> By knowing the voice of God, that's how I get through this. Thank you. Way out before the fall. Peter had a way out before he fell. I mean, Jesus, <coughs> Jesus actually told Peter that he was going to deny him. <coughs> I don't know why I'm coughing. <clears throat> not once, not twice. Three times Jesus spoke, like face to face, spoke to him and said that you're going to deny me. <clears throat> but Peter, what'd he do? Look in Matthew. Matthew 26, 31 through 35, and then we're going to go to John as well. Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written. Listen, it is written. He's quoting the word. I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. 
But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Look into that part of Galilee because there's a very important reason why Jesus went to Galilee. And Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. You ever said those words to God? I'll never do that. I'll never do that. And then you turn around and do it. I have. I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, Surely I say unto you, this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I go to my death with you, I will not deny you. So said all the disciples with him. Jesus is actually standing right here like I'm looking at Uve, and he's standing here saying these words, and then... I mean, they've watched him do all this other stuff, and all of a sudden he says, this is what's going to happen. They've watched him say it before, and it happened. And then this time it's like, no, because they think they know their inner being, who they are. God knows you inside and out. He knows your intentions. He knows everything that you're going to do, and he knows the intentions behind it. That's why he knows the heart. You might do something, and your heart might not be wanting to do it because the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You might do something and God knows your heart behind what you did and you, it was accidental or whether it was whatever, but he knows your heart intent behind doing something. You know, you tick a friend off and you didn't mean to or you, you, you lose, lose a relationship you didn't mean to. He knows your heart behind that. You might not have said it right and you might have approached it wrong, but your heart wasn't there and he knows that. And that's what he goes by is what your heart says. Peter was saying with his mouth, I will not deny you, but he knew with his heart that he was going to. Why? Because Peter was afraid. Until Peter conquered perfect love, he, he was afraid. And in John 13, 36 through 38, Peter was asking Jesus, he said, Master, where are you going? And Jesus answered, you cannot follow me where I'm going, but you will later. Yeah. Master, Peter said, why can't I follow you now? So Peter's asking him these questions. I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus said, this is the, the, the message Bible. Jesus said, really? Really, Peter? Now Jesus is questioning him, really? You will lay down your life for me? Like, really, you're going to lay down? I mean, we, I've said that before, and, and I feel like I've meant it. You know, when I, when I was bounty hunting, and, and I was running toward the shots that were being fired instead of away from the shots, you know, I felt like I would, would have stepped in for someone's life. But you don't know until you get there to that point. God knows. But he said, really? You'll lay down your life for me. He said, the truth is, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. I want to do this little sidestep here for just a moment. The reason we offer in-depth study of the Bible, Kaneo was one of our ways to go in deeper into the Bible, is because you learn things that you probably wouldn't know surface reading the Bible. This has been studied. This has been, what I'm going to tell you has been studied. It's been thought out. It's been, it's been studied out. There's some controversy on it, but... but um, Look into it yourself. This is how I believe it happens. There was a temple crier. This is important where I'm going. There was a temple crier that was also called the cock. Which would cry out a declaration. A man that would cry out a declaration called the cock. It's been misconstrued to the rooster and whatever else. But if you'll study the history of those times, roosters and, and chickens were not allowed in the temple area in Jerusalem. 
The reason is because they sneak off and they go into all kinds of little places. They could get into all little crevices and they were afraid and they made a ruling because they were afraid that if, if they allowed those type of unclean animals in the area, that somehow they would get into the Holy of Holies. And if you know anything about the Holy of Holies, a priest would go in there one time. It's so sacred that a priest would go in there one time a year. And when he went in, they would tie a rope around his ankle. In case he died while he was in there, they could pull him out. That's how sacred the place was. So they set these boundaries, and they didn't let the, those kind of animals come in. So here you have Jesus getting ready to walk by Peter. Peter's already stood there, and he's already denied him the first time. Second time comes around. And this is probably within an hour span. It wasn't like one after another. It was a time period in between this. Denies him. Then the second time he denies him again. But the third time when he denies him, it has to do with this. You ever been around a rooster? They crow all day long. I mean, they don't wake up just in the morning. They crow all day long. I mean, it doesn't even matter what's going on. They're crowing all the time. I mean, I've been around them. They just crow. They just like holler all day long. So there's no specific time um, that they, I mean, they do in the morning, but they do in the afternoon. They do all day long. But this particular calling out, what happened was, before Jesus, there was always a sacrifice put on the altar in the morning and in the evening. A sacrifice of a perfect lamb that was out spot or wrinkle, laid for a burnt sacrifice in the morning and in the evening. To represent a continuous burning, a continuous covering of sins. And that brought aroma to God. It was a lamb without spot or wrinkle. But picture it like this. Jesus comes walking through. Peter's standing there. And the last time that he's asked, are you one of those? He denies. Immediately when he denies, Jesus is right there. And the town crier calls out. This is the offering that is about to be slain. The offering, the perfect offering without spot or wrinkle is what the declaration was. Because that's what they would declare. So he's declaring this. The cock, which is they call it a rooster. No, he, this man declared these words out in the morning, in the evening, when, when the sacrificial lamb was laid on the altar. He called these things out. So here he is. Calling it out before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. He's denying him. Jesus is coming by because, and he's being called out that he's coming by the perfect lamb that's covering us continually is going to be slain. That's Jesus slain for you and I continually. No longer do we have to go through all these Animals being slain because Jesus finally was the final sacrifice and offering for us. The Holy of Holies was the place where the, the bell, the very thick, thick study at bell was super thick. It was ripped from top to bottom, not from bottom to top, but it was ripped from top to bottom to let us know that we have access to that place now. Because Jesus is that access. And through him, John 14, 6, he is the only way. And we can get to heaven through him. But Peter denied him three times. He's not the only one. There was times that we denied him. There was times we've been put in a spot. We've denied him. Different ways, shapes, and forms. We've denied him. Many people have denied him. In, 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 in the word of God, John 1, 11, he goes to his own house or to his own and those that, that were his own didn't even receive him. They didn't receive him either. But he'll always give you a way out, just like he did Peter. You just have to hear him. Listen to him and obey him. How many of you ever heard, heard somebody say something, but you didn't listen to what they said? 
There's a difference. There's a difference between hearing somebody and listening to somebody. It's a big difference. You can hear all day long all the things that you're told to do, but if you don't listen to them, then you can't obey them. You have to hear, you have to listen, and then you have to follow through with obeying. That's what's going to keep you out of trouble. That's what's going to keep you in God's will, in His perfect will. Hearing His voice, listening to what He says, and then obeying what He says. My kids all, all the time, I hear you, I hear you. But they didn't listen to a word I said. Later on, they got into something and it got in a mess and they heard me. They, they, I mean, you hear what I'm saying to you? Yeah, I hear you. But I'm not listening to you because I'm still going to do what I'm going to do. And we do that so much with God, not so much anymore in my life, but some of us do, that we hear him. He says, don't do this or this is going to happen. Just like the railroad track, don't cross it because the lights are flashing, the arms are down, and you may have to pretty much make yourself go around it. We literally get in spots sometimes when we make ourselves bypass those signs and we sin. And then we suffer the consequences of it. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily take us to hell, but it takes us out of the perfect will of God. We don't lose a relation or a, um, relationship, but we lose fellowship. And then we get ashamed and all those things follow. So when you're ashamed, all of, a, all of a sudden you get ashamed because you're still in a relationship because he's your father because you've asked him to come to your heart and live in your life. But you stepped out of fellowship. And when you step out of fellowship, that's your daily conversation with him. Because shame and guilt will do that. They'll bring you out of fellowship with God and they'll bring you in the condom, condom, or confinements of your own mind. And then you start the stinking thinking. Then the enemy just keeps feeding on that, feeding on that, feeding on your words, feeding on your actions. And by that, he just keeps throwing, throwing, throwing things at you because you haven't put on the four armor of God. Constant, constant. First Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtake you, but such as is common to man. So you're not the only one that goes through the stuff you go through. Other people go through the same things too. I mean, you're not subject to, you're the only one that deals with certain things. I mean, everyone, he, the enemy's tried all those things on everybody. And some people, he gra it grabs them. He tries on all of us the same type of stuff. But some, uh, some people grab a hold of those things and they, and, they, and, they, and they apply them to their life. And therefore, their life starts getting going downhill, downhill. They're not reaping the, the attributes of God because they're listening to the enemy. Oh, paying attention to him, paying attention to him more than God. And it says, who will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able this part here. But with the temptation will provide a way of escape also. Always a way out before the fall. There's always a way out before you fall. So that you will be able to endure it. So did you guys think of something that you did and God gave you a way out? If you, if you can think of something, raise your hand. I mean, I can think of something. Something that you've done. Like God said, this is the way out before you do it. Hold on, before you do it, hold on. I'm giving you a way out. And you just know it, and all of a sudden you just, you do it, and you're like, oh, wow, that, that's, that's horrible. Now you have to pay the price. Whatever that might be. The situation that you stepped in. Matthew 26, 41 says this. Keep watching and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Into the things that you're tempted by that you don't enter into them. You're going to be tempted, but you don't have to enter in and step into those temptations. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 6, 13 says, and do not lead, and, and the word of God says, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you know the word of God, you know how to get out of some of these situations. We can't do it without him. We can't do it on our own. Someone said to me the other day, they said, I tried to do this, but I'm, doing, I'm trying to do it on my own. I can't do it. You're not going to be able to do it on your own. You can try all day long to try to do something on your own. You're not going to be able to do it on your own. Let him help you do it. Let him help you get through those struggles, those battles, those temptations, the things that you're fighting over in your mind. Let him help you get through those things. Let him show you the way out and take that avenue out. When the warning signs are down, the railroad crossing says, don't go across, don't go across. And you usually don't pay to find another avenue around. You try to chase the train to the other end of the thing. It, that, that don't work either because the time you get to the other end, it's, it's everyone's done gone that you were waiting with before. So um, that don't work because you get caught in traffic. So don't, don't try to find another way out, another way around. When there's a warning sign there, take heed of that warning sign that's in front of you. Watch how God blesses you with that. I mean, he will bless you, bless you, bless you with that. Galatians 6.1 says, live creatively, friends. This is the um, message Bible. Live creatively. If someone falls into sin, your brother's around you. Forgivenly restore them. Saving your critical commas for yourself. Or you might be in need of forgiveness that day as well. Help people out of problems. Don't be critical of them because you might, what it's saying is you might, you might need some forgiveness of your own at, by the end of the day. People go through stuff. People live things. We don't know their backgrounds. We don't know what they've been through. We don't know how they've been brought up. We have to take all those things in consideration because when you see someone in, in a lifestyle, you just like, you can look at them and you can judge them by the cover. And by the cover, it might seem, wow, they're just, they're horrible. Well, you don't know anything about them. You don't know anything about their day, you know. When I see people crying, I don't know anything about them, but I just ask the Lord to, to bless them. When I see people who are sad, I just, Lord, bless them. Help them. I in Walmart this week, and I, and I walked past this couple, and I could tell they were they were shopping, they had groceries in their cart, but I could tell they were really picking and choosing by the cost of the foods what they were going to get. And I passed them and I heard the Lord say, give them that $100 bill that's in your wallet. So I just kept passing them and I went on out to the aisle. And Shelly was out in the aisle and I... And the Lord said, I thought I told you to give them that $100 bill. And, and uh, I was going to. I just wanted to come out and tell Shelly first. But he was like, wanted me to do it right then. So I said, hey, I got to go back here and talk to these people in the aisle. And I went back and I talked to him. I said, hey, you don't know me, um, but I just want to let you know. And I spoke into them how God sees them. Not so much how I seen them, but how God sees them. Because the situation that they were in, he didn't dream them to be that way. He dreamed none of us to be in those kind of situations. But because of our circumstances, because of not heeding the warning signs, we've gotten ourselves into certain situations. So I spoke into him, and I handed him a hundred dollar bill. I said, God loves you so much. He loves you so much. He believes in you. I believe in you. And he showed me an image of how he's seen them. I always ask him that. Show me how you see them. And I saw them a little later on in the aisle. They were over in the meat aisle grabbing some steaks. I love that. I mean, I love that. Because they were going to eat this little bit of stuff, what they can eat, you know, canned stuff. But, but, but they got the hunter our bill and they got the, and I'm glad that's what they used it for. And I pray, Lord, don't let them use it on drugs, please. But if they did, that's on them. It's not on me. I'm just being obedient to what he said. We can't look at someone and go, well, if I give them this money, they're probably going to use it on drugs. Well, if the Lord tells you to give it to them, you better give it to them. It doesn't matter what they're going to use it for at all. We're supposed to be obedient to him, 
not to our thoughts and our thinking of how it should be. So they got to eat steak. Thank God. And it wasn't because of me, it was because of him. What he said to do. I heard him, I listened to him, and I obeyed him. And because of that, someone got to eat steak. It might be trivial, but it's not. To them, it was a big deal. To them, it was a big deal. You ever have someone come up and just give you a $100 bill for out of the blue? I get them all the time to give to other people. People will come up and like, hey, give this $100 bill to somebody, whoever you... All the time it happens. My wallet's always got a $100 bill, and I mean, it's like, it's like the best wallet ever. It's not for me. The $100 bill's not for me. I mean, if I get in a bind, I can't even spend it unless the Lord says I can have it. But, but it's there because he has it for someone else. And I've given out, I've, I, I don't know how many, I can't even count how many I've given out. But it's not because, he, it's because someone's given them to me and I've given them out. Because it wasn't my money to begin with. I just give them out. And I love it. So if you want to give me a $100 bill today, you can. I'll give it out. I won't keep it, I promise you. I don't keep it. It's not for me. For someone. If, you, if you're shy and you don't know how to go minister to someone, a hundred dollar bill is the best way to open up conversation with someone. Tell them how valuable they are and they say, hey, I, have, I feel like the Lord wants me to give this to you. I mean, that opens up conversation. You don't really have to say a whole lot to that conversation. I don't even tell them I go to church. I don't even tell them where I go to church at. That's not what the point is. I'm not making it about me. I'm not making it about life of love. I'm not making it about that. I'm making it about them in that moment. That's being obedient to God, hearing his voice, listening to what he says, obeying what he says to do. Don't be overcome by the evil one. But overcome evil with good. Romans. James 1.12, it says this. Blesses the man who preserves under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. We're all promised if we love him, we believe in Jesus, who he is. Thank you, Lord. Is my mic cutting in and out back there? Don't ignore the warning signs. This goes with your health. You know your body gives you warning signs in your health. Don't ignore them. You know your body better than anybody else. Don't ignore the warning signs or you're going to be in a dire strait. Don't ignore the warning signs. If you got a pain, you figure out what the pain is, where the root of the pain is, you pray about it. God said you're already healed. And if your manifestation of the healing don't come now, it'll come when you're in heaven. But... I want to be healed now. I believe that we can be healed now because he's already paid the price for our healing. Walk in it. And you walk in it by knowing the signs. He gives you signs. He says, ow, my leg hurts. Why does my leg hurt? Well, because I broke my foot. You know, whatever. There's a reason why your leg hurts. Ask the Lord what it is. Get to the root of the problem. Deal with the root of the problem. Pain goes away. Pain is only there and it's a good thing. It's only there to let us know something's wrong. You agree? You don't have to agree with me. I'm just telling you. If I get hurt, the pain is to let me know something's wrong. Otherwise, there's people who don't feel pain, but they have to walk on not needles because they wouldn't feel it and they would they bleed out. But but they have to walk on edge because they have to. See what's going on with their body. If you have no pain and, and somehow you cut your toe off and you don't know it, you'll bleed out. Pain's good. It don't have to stay. So if you have pain in your body right now, command it to leave. But find the root of it. Ask the Lord to get to the root of it, deal with the root of it. And when he, when he deals with it, you just say, pain, leave now in Jesus' name. It has to. How's your back? Better? Good? Still in a lot of pain? No? See? Speak to it. 
go. It's that simple. That's the authority that you carry. So with your health, he gives a way out. With the words that you say, he gives a way out. Has anyone ever typed a message to someone? Like you text this big, long message to someone. It's like, I'm going to tell you something right now. And you text it in a message. And all of a sudden, you just, this Holy Spirit says, listen, listen. You can't do that. You can't say that. Oh, yeah. Then all of a sudden, you just delete it and go, hi. If only we knew the texts that were there before that hi, or before that praying for you, or before that I love you, or whatever that text was. If only we knew that. If thank, thank the Lord that the phone, well, they might keep it. I don't know. I mean, they're, they're so, they, they might keep record of what we delete on our phone. But I don't know. Hopefully some of the messages I've texted are deleted forever. I've been mad at people before, and I'm like, I wanted to tell them what I thought about it. And I get through my whole text, and I start reading it back, and I'm like, well, you're pretty dumb. Send that kind of a text to somebody. Delete it. I know you guys have done it. I, I, I know you've done it. He always gives us a way out in our words. When you speak to someone, when you, even when you speak to your wife or your husband, he gives you a way out before you say that stupid thing that you're going to say. It's going to cause the argument all night long. And then hopefully you got enough sense to fix it before you go to bed at night because the Lord says that we should do that. Don't, don't go to bed being angry at each other or at a situation because the enemy, that's an open door for the enemy to just pound on you in the middle of the night. You have to clean those. I don't care if you stay up till 1, 2, 3 in the morning. Get it fixed before you go to bed. Because if not, you open the door and the enemy can walk right through that door and he can hammer you all night long. And I'm questioning the Lord right now in myself. I'm questioning the Lord. That, like my question is to God. Does the enemy have control of my thoughts? Or can he, can he put thoughts in my head? I know there's different scriptures that, that he come on to people and he come into people and different things. But these are were, these were people that wasn't serving Jesus. So I'm, I'm, I'm literally, that's where one of my studies are right now. Because I want to know that in depth. Where do my thoughts come from? Does it come from my past? Does it come from triggers that I've been through, things I've been through from my past hurts? Where do my thoughts come from? That, the Bible says renew your mind to the things of God. So you can get rid of those old thoughts. But where do my thoughts come from? Because I, I, I feel like that the enemy does not have that much power. If he has power to speak into our thoughts, then he, he would do that on a nonstop basis to drive us nuts, I would think. Maybe not. So I, that's where I am. If you have any insight for me, um, Steve might have. If you have any scripture for me, because I want to know... If he has that kind of power or not. You know, he can suggest things. We can see things and it triggers things. We can hear things and it triggers things. But does he have the power to put thoughts in your mind? If you're watching online, send me a... <laughs> I just got a text that said Hi. Thank you for that. God, you're so good. Oh, really, I did. I just got a text you said. With your thoughts, he gives you a way out. With your thoughts, you're thinking, thinking. He gives you a way out. With your actions, he gives you a way out. And I'll close with this. I know some of you know this. Some of you might not. But when I, when, I, when I was in the car crash, and I died in the car crash, I had a way out before I died. I had a way out before I got in the car crash. I literally, the Lord literally spoke to me and said, leave the job now. I said, okay. I had the whole crew pack up, so we're leaving now. I was working on Elaine's house. 
I told the whole crew, I said, we're, we're, we're done, leave now. Three o'clock. I said, let's, we're done. They, you know, and, and you, it, you tell a crew, hey, it's, it's quitting time. They're, especially on a Monday, they're like, hey, let's go. We're, we're good. And uh, so they packed up faster than they normally pack up for some reason. <laughs> and uh, I called my wife. I said, I'm coming home. She said, well, you can't. I said, oh, yeah, I can. I said, the Lord told me I need to leave now. I said, I need, need to be obedient to that. And I, this is our conversation. And she said, well, no, you can't because there's a, you, and I don't want to mention names here, but she said, you, you got to wait on somebody to bring something to you. And I'm like, no, I'm not waiting on anything. I'm, I'm leaving now. So I heard God say leave. I tried to listen to what he said, but I didn't obey him. Because I didn't obey him, put me in a half hour later than what I was. Put me right in line for that wreck. There was other cars involved in the wreck. So I don't know the whole detail of it, but there was cars right beside me, two other cars. I'm the one that, that hit the guy head on, that turned in front of me. Green light, I'm going, I hit head on. I believe I wasn't supposed to be in that accident. But because I was in that accident and I died in a car crash, God turned it all out for good. Maybe even saved the lives of the other two people that were in the car crash. I don't know. I don't know the outcome, what the outcome would have been because they hit the car too. I hit him, then they hit him. So he was hit by three different cars. But he turned in front of all three of us coming this way. So I don't know the whole outcome of that. I just know my outcome. And I know that there's a book coming out of it. I'm in the middle of that, and I know I've said that, but I really am in the middle of writing a book. And the book is all about your yes, what your yes, what his yes is to us, what our yes is to him, and what your yes is to him. Our actions and obedience make a difference. And sometimes it's life or death difference. Let's stand. Turn the ambient up a little bit. Have you been disobedient? Have you not followed the signs that God's given you, the warning signs? I gave you a good warning when we come out here that... that Brother Randy's coming and speaking a message, man, that's going to fire you up. It's a good sign. Take those signs as well. Don't miss Father's Day. But have you been disobedient to the signs that God's given you? Every day, on a daily basis, he's individually speaking to us. We have to be keen enough and not be numb to the signs that God's putting in front of us. We have to not ignore the signs that he's given us, just like the railroad sign. You can't ignore those signs. You have to be obedient to those signs or it could cost you your life. And being obedient it might not just cost you your life, but it might cost a relationship. Being disobedient might cost a relationship. It might bring shame and guilt onto you that's not for you to have. Along with disobedience brings those things. And those are not from God. They're from the enemy. Now, I don't know if there's anyone here today that have been disobedient to the voice of God you have, I encourage you to come and pray. And all you have to do is line up to what he said to do. You put past what's happened. Jesus said he's an advocate for you if you mess up. If you sin, he's an advocate and he will forgive you of those sins. That's what he does. That's what he paid the price for. But you have to be the one to confess those sins to him. 
So if you've been disobedient, if you've, you've ignored the warning signs that God's given you, give that to him this morning and just be obedient. Recognize his voice. So much, guys. So much we can have that we don't have because we're disobedient. So much that he wants for us that we're not going to get because we're disobedient. This is a good message. I mean, this is a good thing. I mean, I, I want to catch you guys before you get into that state of, of numbness, of not obeying Him. I mean, if you're seeing, watching things on TV and the Lord says, no, 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 they just took my name in vain, no, I don't want you watching this, no. I mean, how many times will we let those things happen in our life before we finally realize, hey, we, we, we've got to get this fixed. We've got to start listening to the voice of God. Pornography has attacked so many men in America. Women, too, now. There's more, there's more sex stores than there are McDonald's in America. And there's a lot of McDonald's. But it's run havoc over our men. It's not that our men are bad men. It's that our men have made some bad choices because they're not lined up with the Word of God. They're not heeding the warning signs that God has for them. Rise up, man. Let's become better than that. It doesn't make you a bad person. It just means that you've made bad choices. With your finance, it's the same thing. You want something, God says, no. Go ahead and do it anyhow. And then you get in a bind. And when you get in a bind, you're not blessed by that bind. You're confined and you're, you're, you're strangled by that bind. Chains that you put on yourself. We can't do that. We have to be obedient in every area of life. And God gives us a way out. It's okay to have things. It's okay to want things. It's okay to, to go after things. But ask the Lord. Let Him be a part of your decisions that you make. Let Him show you what He has for you. The Word of God says we have access to heaven and all that it has. God wants us to be rich children. He wants us to display that richness. One of the biggest things that he wants us to do is love. When you display love to a brother, that radiates out to everyone that's looking. They see that kind of love. Charles a man. I want people to look at me and say, I, I want what he's got. I want, I want what he's got. I want that kind of love. Anybody else? Husbands, the way you talk to your wives, listen to God before you say a word. Just keep your mouth shut. Don't talk in the heat of a conversation. Walk away. Like, like walk away. You know from the past what it's going to turn out to be. There might be forgiveness in the end, but you know what you're going to go through until that end time comes. Walk away. Wives, same thing. Or you stop letting your men lead the house. Leading the house is what he's called to do. Prophetically, put your dress on and let him lead. Hear the Lord, what he says. The role of a family, how it's supposed to go. God, husband, wife. They two are one. Don't hear what I'm not saying. They don't control you or you control him. Let your husband be the man of the house. This is why America is in the way it is today. Why men are turning away from God. Why the church is full of more women than men because women have overstepped their boundaries. Stay in your lane. 
the warning sign. Stay in your lane if you want to have a healthy, wholesome relationship. Stay in your lane. I could go on and on and on about different things that God wants to say. But that's it. I'm stopping here. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for your heart, for us, Lord, for your warning signs. We thank you. We glorify you. We magnify you, Jesus, for you're holy and worthy of all praise and all glory. We lift you up, Lord. Father, when you tell us something, Lord, we will hear you. We will listen to you, and we will obey what you say to do. From this day forward, let our ears be tuned to what you have for us what you want for us, that you give us the best outcome in every situation, that we know you're always right and you're always good. Lead us, Father, in the ways of righteousness to our knees, to the throne room, the relationship, the fellowship that you want for us. Glorify you in Jesus' name. Thank you, guys. See you on Father's Day. It's going to be awesome. Bless you.